on Brandon about Conan uh, being on My Favorite Murder. I listened to that episode because you were like, hey, did you hear it? And I was like, nope. I'm yeah. so far behind. I haven't listened in like months. Well, and then he said that he went to the fucking murder trial and he drove by the house. And I was like, he's so fucking legit. And then I also realized how old he is. Because <laughs> <So, Shit. laughs> he said I was born in 63. I was like, my mom was born in 61. But he looks pretty good. Good. Yeah, yeah, that Canadian skin must be flawless. Yes, yes. Uh, very pale. So maybe <laughs> vampire. I don't know. Do they have red hair? Yeah, I don't think redheaded <laughs> vampires. So I really like Conan or whatever. He's really fucking funny. And then to find out that he's into that thing that I'm into as well as in as a lot of people are into, and that's why that show is so successful. It was just like, are you yeah. fucking kidding me? You're hilarious and you like murder stuff. And you went yeah. by the house, so I'm <gasps> suspecting you're either way into murder or you're into ghosts too, because you went by the house people were murdered at. Yes. I don't know. I don't think that's something that necessarily people into forensic files and stuff like drive by the house too were you looking for clues yourself I don't think so so I found that to be an extra step and I feel like he's done other things that make me think that he's into the kind of ghouls and goblins I mean the thing that stuck out in my mind was him talking about how his wife made him this like a uh, piece of wood that has the word murder inscribed <laughs> in it and it's like in his office and he had some dude come over. I don't know if it was a producer or a writer or whatever, but the dude was like, you know, if something were to happen to you, your wife is going to be a suspect right away because of this. <laughs> I fucking love that. And he's just like, whatever. Whatever. This is a podcast, right? Oh, shit. I love our podcast, Wendy. <laughs> it's called the Creatures of the Night podcast. And I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. Sometimes I forget that's what we're doing. I mean, because... <laughs> <laughs> Three hours into conversation. I'm right. like, wait, do you want to record something? This is Wendy and Chris Knight. So really what we do is we get together every other weekend. Sometimes we paint and sometimes we drink. I love which we No, we always drink. <laughs> no, I don't know. Just, just disclaimer for when I can't pronounce shit later and stuff. That's what's going on here. Like sometimes by meaning every Saturday we drink. Every time we podcast. And then also every Saturday. Right, right. <laughs> so right. I'm having my drink with or without this podcast. Yes. What do you do to prepare for your podcast? Like we don't, we sit here for seven hours. Um, <laughs> so what do you bring to the table? What do you have like around you? Okay. So I always make sure that I have a notepad, a clean notepad and a pencil so I can write shit down. So smart. So that I can, when I'm editing and stuff, I can make, I'm making my key notes for things that I have to yeah. pay attention to. Oh, uh, I, I only make sloppy notes of things <laughs> I want to. Google later and then half the time the next morning I'm like what did I write this down for anyway, <laughs> one of these things move on what else did you write I have my two bottles of wine <laughs> oh <laughs> my one bottle of water which is half empty yeah and my moon <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually lit up isn't that that's so cool I love that my moon um that's it really for preparing for our podcast um, sometimes I take a nap, but I already told you that I napped all day. So tonight I watched American Horror Story. Um, so I wouldn't be jittery because believe it or not, I don't know if this happens to you, but I sometimes get kind of jittery before we record. Oh, I purposely get jittery. I think. No, no, but I had a cup of coffee. Oh, that kind of jitters. Yes. So I'm like, wake up, Wendy. If you were falling asleep, here you go, which I wasn't really. So, but still, I drink a cup of coffee anyways. And then I have, to, I have a laptop that moves all around this house. Um, but I have to bring it into my office, plug it up because I'm afraid it'll die in the middle. So I keep it charging the entire time. Probably not good for it. Hook up my mic, make sure my story is nearby. I've got to bring my wine, my wine bottle <laughs> and my cup of my, no, my giant liter of water yes, that is empty now because oh. we've been at this for a while. Uh, so I'll start getting <laughs> really drunk now because I don't even have water to dilute it. I don't typically have snacks, but I had some snacks this time that I've been munching on in between things and a new addition. 
a bucket of ice, which was so clever. That is clever. Yeah. So we're good. We're ready. We're, oh, that was loud probably, but oh, I'm loud. And my cell phone. Cause every now and then Wendy will text me something from whatever she's talking about that I need to look at. <laughs> like for instance, uh, the guys from Tennessee Wraith Chasers, which by the way, I have to bring that up because I was listening to one of our past episodes and I actually said Tennessee Wrath Chasers. Oh. And I was like, the fuck is wrong with me? Well, you've been in New England for a long time. <laughs> and so I imagine, I, I knew you pronounced it wrong when you said it. Damn. But like correct I said. Correct me next you, time because I was like, nope. oh, wrath. I will not correct you because <laughs> you've been, in, like I said, you've been in New England for a long time now. And you just kind of make up those names however you want. Well, look. Because you guys up there sure as fuck don't spell things the way they should be pronounced. So I just figured that's how they pronounce it up there, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah. So I want to point out that I did say that wrong. I heard that shit. And, I mean, I just I covered my face with my hands. And I was listening. <laughs> Listening to that podcast while I was driving. So probably not a good thing for me to do, but definitely it is not Tennessee Wrath Chasers. As I mentioned, it is Tennessee Wraith Chasers. There you go. Got it. Well, it's their fault for having a silly name in the first place. We're just <laughs> fucking joking, by the way. Anyways, so I was in Canada um, and I went there for a beautiful wedding. And congratulations to Lucas and Heather. They are like the cutest couple you will ever see in your life. So photogenic, so adorable. She like laughs all the time. And I said to my youngest when we were watching her during the ceremony, I was like, I don't know if she's doing it because she's nervous or if she is just fucking gorgeous all the time. But I'm really annoyed by all of this <laughs> in a jealous, annoyed way. And I said something to someone later and they were like, oh, yeah, she kind of laughs when she's nervous or whatever. But then I saw every photo that people posted afterwards about the wedding. And I'm like, nope. Yep. She's just fucking beautiful all the time. So that's annoying. Aww. So she's gorgeous. He's adorable. They're beautiful. The wedding was great. It was so much fun. Awesome music awesome food and then it was so awesome to see family that sadly we only get to see like every couple of years so it was cool to get to see and hang out with them but of course uh anytime i go out of town i have a and it doesn't matter that there's just a short amount of time to be there and there's lots of people to visit with yeah. it does not stop me from being selfish and making a list of haunted locations that might be nearby so that i can explore them in any free mm -hmm. time i might find yeah However, oh, and my whole plan was to, like, explore these haunted locations and one of them particularly for sure. I really wanted to write my story about if we had a chance to go there. But thanks to Mother Nature, she had a different plan. Oh. The entire fucking world froze over. or The, the blizzard. The northern part <laughs> of the world froze the fuck over pretty much as soon as we got there. Yeah. Um, so the roads were pretty shitty and we were limited on exploring and stuff. And so I didn't get to see many of the locations that I had on my list, but it was still a good trip. I mean, and honestly, none of us had ever seen this much snow. Tennessee huh. gets snow and people don't realize that. Like Canadians don't realize that we, we have seen snow before we mm. get one or two good snows a year in West Tennessee, but I'm talking like six inches of snow. This was like two feet of snow right, that had right, come right. down in the weekend that we were there. I've never seen this much snow. I'm sure you explain this to them, though. Tennesseans, the part of Tennessee that we're from, we get more ice. Then we get snow. Right. But it, I don't think they deal with the ice like we do or anything because – I, later in the week, we were going to be gone or whatever. They were going to get rain. Yeah, we got rain. And I was like, oh, that's yeah. what makes ice. Like, do you guys, are you going to be okay? Do you know how to handle that? Because I can remember living in West Tennessee, and I, we had an acre and a half lot surrounded by fucking pine trees. But, and, and so when the ice would hit and freeze over and the power would go out, so you wouldn't be able to have a fan on or anything to kind of block the noise, you'd be laying in bed freezing to death. And then you would also listen to crack, 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 as like all these branches were falling down. And you're like, there's this one tree that's close to the house. Please don't let it be that tree. <laughs> that tree wasn't a pine tree, though. And it wasn't. 
that tree, <laughs> but all the pine trees would fall apart. Can't handle it. But but that didn't happen while we were there. We were fine. It was just a bunch of snow. It was pretty cool because we don't always get to see snow like that and everything. So it was fun, but it did limit my exploring these locations that I had planned on. So I I had a few places I did drive bys on, but that was about it. But I still felt like I had to do a story from Canada because even though I'm American, I was born and raised in West Tennessee and in, in Memphis, based pretty much. And um, but my in-laws are in Canada, and when we visit there, it's just they're just so freaking nice. Not just my in-laws, but everybody that we kind of encounter has always been so nice to us. And they they live in a small town, and um. There's small towns that's kind of surround that area, and it's just the coolest vibe. I love small town vibes, and you totally get it from there. All the little local spots to go and eat at or how you can, like some things might be in walking distance, you know, walking distance when there isn't a thousand feet of snow on the ground. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, it's so cool to, to be like that because I've never lived in a small town like that, though my family, my grandmother, she lived in a small town, and that's the only ever feeling I've ever had of that is in Dysburg, Tennessee. Yeah. And so it takes me back to that kind of mindset when we go and visit Canada. So that part of Canada feels like a second home to me or another home to me. I love going up there. You know, you talked about like coming out here into the West and how beautiful it yeah. is. But when we go back to Canada or even come out to your area, we're in just as impressed with that stuff. Just how the little local vibe and the the old architecture and the history in the area. It's just as impressive as the, you know, fucking mountains out here. And that's that's all you're really seeing out here, too, is the, the mountains. They are pretty. Though. Oh, it's colorful and it's ghostly and open and vast. And I think that yeah. um, going to see something like that in Arizona, when you're used to seeing, you know, stuff in New England, it's just, it's so different. You're used to one thing and you get like a, a little taste of something that's different. And it's like, God damn it. Yeah. I want it all the time. I want to see it more. I, I want more of it. And it, it goes that way for us too. Uh, and the only thing that's the kicker, like, so we're here all the time and no, we don't ever get sick of seeing those mountains. Not so far. The three and a half years that we've been here, when we first moved here and I was always in awe of it, I asked, uh, you know, the family, I was like, do you think we'll ever get sick of this? And yeah, there's sometimes that you're kind of driving to work and you don't even think about the fact that you're in a fishbowl of mountain views. But then but then the sun's just setting just right and you look over and you're like, God, that is fucking beautiful just oh i was driving home the other day and when i when i turn on to my main road to then turn into my neighborhood you get a view of the tucson mountains and the sun is setting on the other side of them always and it's like a fucking bob ross painting wow. it's just like the sky is this pink schmear and it's just it's just fucking gorgeous. You don't ever get sick of it. But when you go back to small town Canada and you go to New England and we eat that shit up, too. And it's only the cold that runs us away. <laughs> We're like, yeah, this is fun, but I can't feel my fingers. So actually, yeah. I'm going to go home for a while where it's warm <laughs> and I'll see you guys in the summer. So but we love it out there, too, so much. We appreciate that small town vibe and uh, so this I'm doing my story on one of my favorite haunted locations that I have been to in Canada thus far as a shout out to my Canadian peoples to show my appreciation to just how awesome they are so this is the story of the old Fort Erie so Old Fort Erie, also known as simply as Fort Erie, because it wasn't always old, you know. Well, I guess uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> you sure? Was the first British fort to be constructed as part as a network of forts, forts developed after the Seven Years' War, or often referred to in the United States, because I never knew it was even called the Seven Years' War. It's the French and Indian War. It is located at the southern edge of the town of Fort Erie, Ontario, 
directly across from the Niagara River from Buffalo, New York. You can see it from there. You can wave to them. Aww. It's really pretty, too. Driving that strip of land, the waterway, I don't know what you would call it, <laughs> but it, it's a really pretty area as well. The original fort was built in 1764. It was located on the Niagara River edge below the present fort. They built it right pretty much on the water and it, it serviced as a supply depot and a port for ships transporting goods and troops and passengers via the Lake Erie to the upper Great Lakes mm. because they connect through like canals and stuff. Right. That fort was damaged by winter storms. Mm as it would, right. I would assume, directly on the fucking water like that. And it's cold as shit. No. And, uh, <laughs> uh, winter storms destroyed the original fort, and in 1803, plans for a new fort uh, were formed, and that was on the higher ground, pretty much directly behind the original fort. So just across the street, kind of. It was made larger, and it was made of flintstone. The original one was kind of just made of wood, so no wonder it got fucked up. Hmm. But but uh, it was not quite finished as the War of 1812 started. But that didn't stop it from being a big part of the war. Fort Erie was actually the site of the bloodiest battlefield in the history of Canada. Ooh, I love the way that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Canadians tend to not be very confrontational, though. So I feel like this award, you know, is kind of like they stopped after this war. <laughs> This, this is, is it. it. They, they were like, we achieved it. This is it. Bloodiest battlefield. No, we're done. Actually, we don't like that whole fighting thing. We're right, lovers, right. not fighters. You know, and they gave up. But not really. There was a few <laughs> other skirmishes. So in 1813, Fort Erie was held for a period of time by the U.S. forces. But then they abandoned it by June 9th of 1813. They run off to go to do something else. Okay. And the British take back over. They're like, cool, cool, cool. This is ours. But come July 3rd of 1813. 14, another set of American forces landed nearby and they capture the fort again. They're like, oh yeah, that looks good. We like that. We'll take that again. Whoa, okay. <laughs> and the British just, I guess, just like, no, I'm sorry, my bad, and leave very politely. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. We were just, you know, taking care of it. We were just watching over it for you guys. It's fine. Yeah. You, I mean, you had left. So we were making sure that it, you know, thing was kept up right. for you guys. No, I don't really know. They're not that polite. Just funny. <laughs> um, not during this war, at least. Oh. The U.S. Army used the fort as a supply base and expanded the size of the fort. Uh, in 1814, at the end of July, after the battles of Chippewa and Lundy's Lane, the American Army withdrew from those areas areas back to Fort Erie and then they were surrounded by the British. So they're in old Fort Erie which is just Fort Erie then. And then the British are surrounding them, sieging them basically into the fort. Mm -hmm. They can't go anywhere. And it's just a standoff between the two. Okay. In the early hours of August 15th, 1814, the British launched an attack against the fort, but with a well-prepared American defense against them, plus this huge explosion that happened on the Northeast wall of the fort with tons of British forces on the other side, of the wall, so causing a bunch of, bunch of casualties right there that basically there wasn't a whole lot of American forces on that wall. It just blew up and British people were on the other side trying to get in and it, it, so it devastated them. With all that, it just kind of destroyed the British chances for success. Overall, they lost over a thousand of their men. Shit. And by mid-September or so, the British left the siege. They they couldn't take it anymore. They had lost so many people and retired their positions to the uh, north of Chippewa after an unsuccessful American attack at Cook's Mills west of Chippewa. News reached the American forces that eastern that the eastern seaboard of the United States was under the attack. So on November 5th, 1814, with the winter approaching as well, the American forces destroyed the fort. They're just like, well, we don't need this shit wow. anymore. We're needed elsewhere. So they did as much damage as they could, and then they withdrew to Buffalo and then to go join up with whatever fight really needed them on the eastern seaboard, you know. So now it goes back to the British. They take it over, but 
the Treaty of Ghent was signed December 24th of 1814, ending the War of 1812. Fearing further American attacks, the British continued to occupy the ruins of the fort until 1823. Some of the stones of the fort, because it was like so bad, fucked up. Yeah. The Some of the stones of the fort were incorporated into the construction of St. Paul's Anglican Church in 1824. Okay, so how far away is the church from the fort itself? Is that like a, a pretty good distance or I mean, is it no, on the it, site? It's just two miles down the road on Niagara Parkway. Okay. So it, it's not far from the fort at all. And they were like, yeah, we're not using those rocks. You can go ahead and have uh-huh, them. Those rocks. Uh, because they weren't seeing any action either. Yeah. The war was over. America didn't care. They weren't coming after them anymore. It was always between America America and the British anyways. So, you know, I know, I understand there's British forces left there, but they're, they're Canadian people or they're what is forming into Canadian people now anyways. And so American just wanted their independence along that line and that's it. They kind of gave up after that. Right. So they're doing their own thing and the fort didn't see much action for years after that until June of 1866, the Fenians, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. They are an Irish American veterans of the American uh, Civil War demanding independence from Britain, from Ireland. So these are Irish Americans that are like, we don't want Britain to have anything to do with Ireland, but we're an American in Canada, guys. Calm down. But that didn't stop them. They mounted several raids upon Upper Canada that got together and just were like, let's go cause some trouble across this border. Basically, they're like, all our Irish brotherhood are doing their thing over in Britain, and we want to do our part here. And and we know that Canada is still owned by the British, and they have British people maybe up there. I don't know. How many British people do you know that live in Canada? I don't. I don't know anybody. I know nobody that lives in Canada <laughs> other than your folks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't I don't really know what they were thinking, but I feel like these guys were just like, we want to do our part to cause some trouble and let uh, Britain know that we don't want to be a part of them anymore. But you live in America. Calm down. But anyways, they went over there and caused trouble anyways. And the Fenians occupied the town of Fort Erie. Oh. They demanded food and horses, but they had no payment for it. Ha. And the people of Fort Erie are like, what the what the fuck? What, right. what do you want? I don't understand. Why is this happening? Are here? the Canadians still being polite? at this point because i'd be like get the fuck up out of here with your demands no they wouldn't they wouldn't be like that at all they would be like i'm sorry i'm sorry they're so polite i'm sorry we don't have food and horses for you Uh, and uh, and i'm not making fun of them that's really how they say it and and that's how my kids and i knew that we were standing out by saying sorry (laughs) so anyways back to these (laughs) fiends so when they didn't get food and horses they cut the fucking telegraph lines the wires whoa and then they tore up the railroad tracks who did the british guys did no they're fucking irish americans just drunk on whiskey and Uh, i get it irish don't get me started (laughs) no but you have to understand like how shitty they were treated by the british for so long and um they have every right to be pissy but I just don't understand why they had to go up into Canada with that mess. Like the, those poor people in Fort Erie were just chilling, doing their own thing, ice skating and stuff. Aww. And then you come up there and you're and like, like, give us what, give us your food and horses. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have any food and horses for you. Like we walk everywhere and we only have what we can eat at our table. And they're like, I'm going to fucking cut your telegraph wires. And they're like, shit, oh, that's not cool. Not cool. Especially when it's all they got is a telegraph wire. I know. It sounds like some mayhem that was going on, basically. It really does. The Fenians then returned back to Fort Erie, where they defeated a small force of Canadian military that was there at Fort Erie, and they took the fort over. However, unable to get reinforcement from across the river and worried that a large group of uh, British forces was on the way to come and get them, the Fenians commander decided to retreat back to the United States. Some of the troops kind of deserted and went their own route, and then, uh, but approximately Approximately 850 surrendered to the forces of the uh, American Navy, and 
then, you know, they were treated however way they were supposed to be treated after that. I don't have that information. No. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> this was a last notable Fenian raid on Upper Canada, as it should be, because like I've expressed, I don't understand why this is happening to these poor Canadians, but uh, leave them alone. But I guess there was a maybe a large presence of British forces, and then I could understand that. But I'm just concerned for all the Canadians there. The Battle of Ridgeway was a pretty big deal, so they lost a lot of people there, yeah. and I do believe that was an entire Canadian military force at the Battle of Ridgeway, because British hadn't quite swooped in to help them out, but they were on their way. And that's when the Irish American group was like, nope, never mind, we can't handle this. So they, they noped out and went back home. The Irish Americans that went up to Canada uh, that partook in this raid, I bet those motherfuckers were from Boston. <laughs> I'm just saying. They're right. That's right down the fucking road. <laughs> Honestly, I only brought that whole thing up because it was the last bit of action that Fort Erie had seen. I mean, oh, okay. it, between the War of 1812 and these Fenians coming up and causing their little havoc, that's all that Fort Erie really saw. Hmm. Other than that, it was just a supply port wow. and um, stuff. I wonder if the uh, Schultzes, uh, nope the Patricks. And I wonder if they went up to Canada to fight in this raid. I, I mean, I, that would be interesting to know where your uh, ancestry lies in here. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, the Patricks, as far as I know, my Patricks, and this is why I need to get an ancestry.com yes, going we on. We should both do it. We should, so that we would make more sense on these podcasts. And when we start talking about our Polish and Irish, Irish and yeah. heritage, we'll know what we're talking about. But as far as I know, the ones that I, my family came over on the potato famine, and they immediately moved down south to Kentucky and made a home there, which is follows along with like historical things that they were trying to push the Irish down south because they wanted the northern, eastern, your area to be more elite. And so all the fancy families and English families and whatnot would take part in all of that beautiful city life. And Irish and the lower class would go down south. So my family moved down to Kentucky, and that's the bit that I know. So I doubt they were a part of this raid because they were probably too busy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, moving, moving down south. Gotcha. Moving down south, doing their own thing, don't give a shit. That's kind of how the, the they operate. <laughs> so gotcha. I don't know about all this. I bet it was your Boston crew coming out of there, the Irish crew there, uh, which were treated very poorly. So I don't blame them to be like pissed off and want to go do something about it. They also probably had some PTSD oh, from the Civil War. Yeah. yeah. And they were just like ready to fight anybody. Yeah. You know, they didn't know about those kind of things back then. So who knows? And Irish people love to bottle up their feelings. It doesn't help. So <laughs> and by bottle, I mean whiskey, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. I don't mean to keep it inside because you get them drunk enough. They'll tell you all about it. <laughs> so after this. The fort laid uh, vacant for a long time, and the building just kind of fell into disarray. The barracks and the walls and the old mill, mm. it was it was still standing, but it was in very bad shape. I bet it's beautiful at this point. <laughs> it, it really is, and it gets better and better, I feel like, or it did from the times that we've visited. So we've been there twice, and the first time we saw it, the second time there was like a new building, and it, there were more artifacts and stuff. So I'm really proud of them investing in this location because it deserves it. In 1901, the Niagara Parks Commission bought the land that the old Fort Erie is on and reconstruction of the fort was started in 1937. The oh, reconstruction wow. was jointly sponsored by the Canadian government, the National and Providence government, and the Niagara Parks Commission as well because they're self-funded. The fort was restored to the 18 
12 and 1814 period. So it's the what you will see it look like today. That's what it's supposed to have looked like in 1812 between 1814. So anything it might have evolved to after that, that's not what you're seeing. You're seeing that's that. insane. They must have had some pretty awesome pictures at that time frame yeah. in order to restore it to period. Sorry, oh, I, I'm, no, I'm actually, writing and talking at the same time. I say, yeah, and then I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I have no, who the fuck, who the fuck knew what it looked like right. in 1812? I guess they do drawings, right? They do have. drawings and paintings and stuff like that, and they model it after well, that. That's insane that they restored it back that far. Because who's keeping that record? Right. Yeah. I mean, this bitch was attention to detail all the way. She's like chair in, upper, left, corner uh <laughs> tilted 180 degree <laughs> chair had flower pattern beige no i think mostly what they focused on is how many buildings there were and the just the kind of landscape because it, it really had gotten down to like bare ass fucking oh. walls and they built it back up to the two buildings it's really just two main buildings and then grounds after that um now what's in the buildings is very old kind of furniture and whatnot. I don't know where they fucking get it from. That's so cool. Are they stone buildings? Yes. Oh, shit. Like concrete stone or like They're how, really... like, did you get a chance to go into the buildings yourself? Yes. Was it warm when you went in there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh shit. So this was like some serious, I, I mean, I'm just saying that because I've been in some buildings in Maine at the forts up here I'm not even sure if I've taken you to these forts. I, I assume that I have just because I, I, in my mind, you've explored everything that I've explored. But it's still drafty as fuck. And <laughs> it's well, on the ocean. It's a beautiful view, but it's like, burr. I need <laughs> fur. I need something very warm. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they had all yeah. of that. So this last time that we went to Canada, we did not get to go to Old Fort Erie. So uh, I actually think it was closed. Uh -huh. Um, I don't think it's open right now for some reason, but uh, maybe just because of the weather or whatever. But two years ago, we went into it and, and five years, seven years or something like that. Before that, we went into it and it's never felt cold and drafty to me. I don't know if it's the positioning and the way the buildings are kind of like land is built up in front of it. Right. Like there's a hill. That goes up a wall. I mean, there's a wall and you walk up a hill and then the buildings are behind that. So there's a lot of barriers between it. Gotcha. It's a very fortified location okay. with the hills that surround it and stuff like that. So it's not drafty or cold. Nope. It doesn't feel that way at all. And then, and then they only really have these in the front of the buildings. They only really have these like, they don't have any windows in the front of the building. I mean, only on the back side, not facing the water where... I think you'd get a lot of the draft. Now that I think about it, there aren't any windows on that side. Isn't that insane? The fort that's right up here in Maine, all of the windows face the bay. They all face the port, well, right where go, the ocean is. If you go to the outer walls, are are there no? Well, yeah, okay. So outside of the between the two buildings, there's walls that you can go upstairs and be on a second level. And on the second level there, they have these tiny slit windows. Yeah, sure. Okay. So right. that you can shoot out. But Big enough to put a gun. In. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so, and, But I don't remember windows being in the building so you're able to see out. Which makes a lot of sense because inside these buildings, there's not fucking soldiers in there. You're not, you go outside for that shit. Go get up on the wall with the cannon and whatnot. This is where people are sleeping or soldiers are getting medical attention or something like that. So yeah, there's no wall, there's no windows on those walls. It still seemed pretty secure. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so the fort hmm. officially reopened as a museum. In July 1st of 1939, during the restoration, a mass grave of 150 British soldiers, and they found three American soldiers that was uncovered. So uh, this mass grave that they found near the fort is not the only mass grave that they found in the area. While a gentleman was building his house over on Snake Hill. What a great name. Are you serious? That's a road? <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy, too, because there's like there's 
houses up here on this upper upper area and then houses on a lower area closer to the water too so i'm like shit you're gonna freeze to death in the winter anyways i don't know which one his house is on though in 1987 he was building his house on snake Snake hill or in the snake hill area and um it's south i believe it's south down the road from fort erie there was a mass grave found of 28 american soldiers And once they went through the process of digging up and excavating the land, they determined which soldiers these were. And they found that they were all American soldiers by the buttons that had been embedded into their spine. Oh, what? Hang on a second. Did you say embedded in their spine? Pretty much. So they don't dissolve down like the fabric tears away and kind of disintegrates and stuff. These buttons are brass buttons, I believe, and silver are brass buttons, and that's not going to break down the same way. So it was kind of laying right there on their skeleton. So uh, the 28 U.S. soldiers were returned to the United States and they were properly buried. Thanks to this guy in Snake Hill, Fort Erie, Ontario. I want his house. I know. It looks like a pretty nice house, too, right on the water and everything. (gasps) But uh, today, Fort Erie is a popular museum and historical park where you can learn the history with interactive displays. You can view artifacts in the museum, plus the two buildings in the fort. They have a bunch of exhibits there showing you different artifacts. You can watch a musket or cannon display. You can watch them fire off those things, which Mm -hmm. is always fun. And you can even... Even play dress up in the uniform, the period piece uniforms, and they have old wooden like musket guns that you can pose with and stuff. Did you guys get in the uniforms? Oh, fuck yes. <laughs> fuck yes. <laughs> and you held a musket? Actually, I think I probably took photos, but everybody else got a uniform coat, hat, and and wooden musket and kept pointing that shit out the window as well, too. Do you have a picture of yourself in the uniform with the musket for the podcast? No. <laughs> I I wish they did, but unfortunately, it's just the kids and everyone. I don't think I did because I'm always stuck behind the camera. That's my life. So uh, no dress up for me, but it it was really cool that they added that. They didn't have that the first time that we visited, but the second time they did. And so that was really cool. I think that was a good addition. Along with the museum, that building wasn't there before. It used to be kind of just free and you would walk in and go into Fort Erie. But this time they make you walk through the museum and pay for sure. And um, but it was a good exhibit. And I, and I really like the what they're doing over there. So you can definitely go and visit it. I definitely recommend it. It's a cool visit. However, beware. Because many visitors and staff will tell you they feel that the presence of the past still haunt the area today. That's what I was looking for. (laughs) Hey, P.S., just so you know, you can't go in that wing unless you're like, you know, okay with paranormal. And I'm the one floating to the front of the (laughs) crowd like, yes, ma'am, doing my weird Mm -hmm. SpongeBob dance with my wiggly (laughs) arms. (laughs) Yeah. That's I will what I'm here for. That shit up. Um, <laughs> so, the ghosts of American and British soldiers, they're said to ro- roam the grounds, especially along the walls of the fort. The sounds of battle Ooh. have been heard, cannons and muskets firing, and commanders like shouting orders to troops. Uh, battle scenes have been reenacted by ghosts, and visitors have been touched. Oh. by things as well. Other strange things have been reported here, including strange lights, mist, shadow figures, feelings of uneasiness, and screams. Ooh. This place is like a paranormal experience grocery store. <laughs> Like you just go in and you just pull whatever you want off the shelf. And, you know, I would like some screams. I'd like some touching. I'd like some shadow figures. And then you go and check out. Are those organic screams? (laughs) (laughs) I believe they are. It's fine. Um, So they have photographic proof 
or at least they did two years ago, the last time I was there, and visited. They have a photograph of an apparition that's on display inside the fort. It was a visiting photographer that was just snapping pictures of the place, you know, just photographing everything. So somebody just took a rando picture, and there's an apparition of it of what they believe is either a woman in a long skirt or it's a man with a long great coat on. Oh. And the picture was taken in the fort's kitchen. I believe it's somewhere in the hallway, though. On like, uh, it used to be on like the staircase going down. You'd look on the post right before the staircase is where they have it. I mean, I just love those great coats. <laughs> I love great coats too. It's freezing <laughs> there, so uh, <laughs> you need to like cover your entire body. So also I found on Facebook and YouTube a paranormal group called Halton. It's H-A-L-T-O-N. Halton? Sounds like Halton, Halton. to me. <laughs> they they investigated Fort Erie back in 2012. So that's stuff that I was right. looking on on Facebook. And they had they had some interesting photos. Talking about photos. Are they the Halton Ghost Hunters group or what are they called? Nope. It just said Halton or Halton Paranormal. Oh, Paranormal. Okay. That's all I got. And they had some very interesting photos. There's this one that's of a creepy looking face mm. that it looks like they're in the kitchen area. And it is just, it's very fucking Ooh. creepy, but it's just of a head. And it's like big eyes and kind of a big mouth and stuff. And then they have another photo that looks like a silhouette of a figure. It's, you can kind of see like shoulders and a torso, but that's about so it. What is it on YouTube then? Is it like an EVP or a video or something? You said it's pictures only. Oh, sorry. So the pictures were on their Facebook page, but on YouTube, it's videos of their investigation of Fort Erie where they got some hits on meters. And two of the investigators said that they even had their legs touched. And actually, I remember this from when we were there and one of the tour guides saying it, that I believe it was when the British occupied the location, their families were there at the fort with them. Mm. Some of the soldiers' families were with them at the fort. So some people believe that little kids haunt the location, though I didn't find any other evidence besides the fact that it was these ladies being touched on the legs, wow. that that was happening. Uh, no EVPs or anything like that to kind of mm. lean toward a child. Okay. But um, th so I found that evidence from them. Also, big fucking surprise. This is a Ghost Adventures episode. <laughs> so years and years ago, like fourth season Ghost Adventures, uh, they have been there. And no, I do not just do locations that Ghost Adventures have gone to. I'm not that fucking crazy obsessed. <laughs> However, they have been there. <laughs> and also, while I was researching Fort Erie, Old Fort Erie, I found a fan cast. It's a podcast that their sole purpose is recapping Ghost Adventures episodes. Oh, we're too late. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever decide to leave me and never talk to me again, and I have no one to talk to about ghost stuff, I'm calling these motherfuckers what? up because this shit's right up my alley. Just to recap. It goes, Don't have a plan. <laughs> I have, I'm not going I have anywhere. A plan B, just in case. <laughs> I'm considerably worried now. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, there was this fan cast that uh, just anybody that might be interested, they're recapping. Ghost Adventures episodes. It's called Insanely Haunted. They did sound very funny. I listened to about half of it. No, I didn't listen to all of it because I had places to be. But and I had seen the episode. <laughs> I'd seen the episode myself. But they were very much like you and I talk about the episodes. Look, I'm a huge Ghost Adventures fan. I love them. They're entertaining. It's funny. I love the locations that they go to. But sure, I talk shit about them too. Don't get me wrong. This stuff is funny for a reason. It's not just funny like, ha ha ha, that was the best joke ever. 
No, it's funny, like, oh, my God, they are such fucking goobers. Right. You look at them with a critical mind, and you're like, hmm, could this be faked? Are they just exaggerating? Is this just in their head? Because we know what it's like to be in a dark, scary place and then kind of let your mind wonder. So <laughs> so these guys that do this insanely haunted podcast, uh, they seem to be on that same page. They're fans of the show, but they were also very honest about it as well. Are they also ghost hunters themselves? I told you I only listened to half the episode. <laughs> no, <laughs> they did not sound like they go out and investigate. They were strictly just talking about the Ghost Avengers episode. Ah. So, yes, it was on Ghost Adventures. They have, there was a whole experience from the Ghost Adventures episode, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> okay. And I'll edit this out. Um, you said this was an older episode, right? So Nick Groff was involved in this one? Yes, he is. All right, cool. Why would you edit that out? <laughs> we don't have to pull a Zach Bagans on Nick Groff here. We can leave him in. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm a fan <laughs> of the um, BC Ghost Adventures. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever so, it's called now. <laughs> so, AD. Is it AD? It's AD. It's after, it's supposed to be yeah. after death. But, but now they do that common era. Stuff. Common era. That's it. Common era. See. We need a, we need a before Nick and after Nick. Or... Yeah. Yeah. But it's not before Nick. It's like during Nick. Or... So this is the during Nick era. The Correct. DN years. DN years. The DN years. The DN years. <laughs> the DN years. And now the... The A-N years. After Nick. Not A-M. A-N. Got it. Right. Not after death. He didn't die. He's still around. <laughs> <laughs> he does more things now, so he's not sad. He does what he wants to. And that's the problem. So... Right. right. <laughs> I don't Fucking know. Right. Tearing it up for no reason. Um, <laughs> so on the Ghost Adventures episode, a Catherine Stark... A volunteer at Fort Erie, or was during this episode, says that in the surgical room, which is upstairs, I believe somewhat over the kitchen area, she saw a bearded man in a white shirt in the window as she was closing up for the night. Like everybody was gone and they were going to close all the windows and she closes the window and behind her, she sees a bearded man in a white shirt and she's like, what the fuck? And looks behind her and there's no bearded man standing in the room. So she peace the fuck out. She's like, doot, doot, doot. gotta get out. Do you have information? Like she saw a reflection of the bearded man in a window. Like she was looking at the window. She yes. saw him behind her. She saw in the it reflection. in the reflection of the window. So, he could be floating oh, outside no. in front of the window. He could be behind her in the room. But she, when she turned around, there was nobody there. There was nobody fucking there. And so she ran the fuck out. And that was it for her. Creepy as fuck. I'm sorry, but I mean, bearded man anyways. <laughs> Reflection. That was... <laughs> No offense to any of you bearded men like out there, but I mean, shaving guys, I guess. I'm just saying because it's fucking cold as shit out here, which you just pointed out earlier in your episode. We're in Canada. Cold as fuck. You're right. She's bearded because it's cold as fuck. Yeah, she saw that, and now she does. From what I heard a, a YouTube video where they were telling the story about what happened to Catherine, and then they said she doesn't volunteer there anymore. <laughs> yeah. No shit. Yeah, they were like, don't know why she quit. But, I mean, she was there when Ghost Adventures went there, and they were still calling her a volunteer, so I don't I don't know how much longer she hung in. I'm just wondering, like, did she say, this shit is fucking scary as hell? Or did she seem like she was um, on board with the Ghost Adventures? Did she seem like she was, um, you know, one of those people that couldn't wait to be on TV with them? Oh, you know what, though? She seemed perfectly fine with it. They were like... Uh, she was given the history of the location and they were like, have you ever seen anything? And she's like, yep, I absolutely have. And she told him the story. But you know what? She was not dressed in period clothes like huh. all the other volunteers they spoke to. So right. I wonder if she had already quit. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. I don't know because uh, that's a good point that you. I just realized she was in regular street clothes and nobody, nobody else was. But her husband, Sam Stark, he is a volunteer there. Oh shit! Her last name is Stark. Yeah, it's Stark. Love that. I know. So, and at the time, they don't. She doesn't. They don't say, "Hey, I'm Catherine, and that's Sam. That's my husband." So when I'm watching the uh, episode, the Ghost Adventures episode. 
I'm like, they're both, they're, both their last names are Stark. They've got to be husband and wife or like, it's a small town. I guess this could be her fucking brother. I don't know. But then when I watch the YouTube clip where they're telling her story, they say her husband still volunteers there. She does not anymore. Oh, so. It seemed like she had the doorway. Yeah, she could have just been connecting and hanging out with them all day. And she's yeah. like, nope, don't care. And you know what? Her husband doesn't necessarily have any ghost stories of his own, but he does like to share the story that many people have seen the headless soldier that walks the grounds. And then he tells about how a soldier had lost his head when a cannonball hit it oh. as a can the dude was getting a shave by somebody and a cannonball came through took his fucking head off and that was it so now everybody sees this headless soldier and they're like that's the guy that got his he- head taken off by a canyon cannon sorry cannon <laughs> canyon (laughs) anyways that's the worst fucking shave ever ever ever. but listen to this though the insanely haunted podcast made a very good point so everybody's making a big deal about the headless soldier who lost his head while getting a shave or whatever what about the dude that was giving him a shave there's some guy walking around with a hole in his belly because he had to have been right behind him. Uh, I, I guess. I mean, is that how it happened? Let's say Charlie is in the barber's chair, right? He's the one right. getting the shave. So I imagine the barber is, I don't know, Timmy. Timmy's the barber. Just for names. I don't know the name. So I'm say Timmy the barber. Charlie's in the chair. So Charlie's laid back. He's Got getting it. a shave. His neck is cocked to the side. And Timmy's the barber. So he's... With a straight blade, because, you know. Oh, the scariest things ever. (laughs) So that's what I'm envisioning. And they say that the cannon would have come through the side. So not only would the victim in the chair have been shot, but also the barber. Right. The barber could be reached over the side. He could have moved his arm. And that moment, the cannonball came through and shot Charlie sitting in the chair. Timmy would have been, like, punched back from the force of the cannonball hitting him. you. But he might not have been shot. I understand. Yeah, I get what you're saying. That I guess they could have stood off to the side. It's just like it depends on where he was shot. I guess I cut my boy's hair and you have to move around their fucking head. Yeah. So I guess when you shave, I, I don't know. I don't shave my fucking face. So, um, you don't No. you know, the <laughs> upper lip here. You know, yeah. That's, the... that's just that little finishing touch tool. It takes just take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bronze tool now and there's no pain. Apparently it's just a zap. <laughs> it never hurt before, but, um, yeah, I guess it could have been off to the side, but you would think that there's still, some shrapnel and explosion going on like uh, it's got to have hit something and caused some fucking damage so it seems like it should be a headless dude and a dude walking around with at least a straight razor in his hand and maybe a little fucked up and the <laughs> two of them together but i guess they don't hang out in the afterlife together they didn't know each other he, he was just providing a service for him anyways so why would he be yeah, hanging out with him he, he didn't even know his name was charlie probably he's just like that's just my three o'clock so <laughs> But um, also just rando cannons coming through. Like when you're like, oh, man, I really got to go get a shave. I'm going to go take care of that. And then all of a sudden, bam. It's like if some shit was going down, would you really like choose this as your best time to go get a shave? It just it had to. I hope it was a surprise. And he's not just the dumbest motherfucker in the world. (laughs) 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 Poor thing. Anyways, so there's a Kate. That volunteers at Old Fort Erie are dead. And she says that she's had an incident in what they call Captain Kingsley's bedroom. It's a large room on the second floor and it's the officer's quarters. It has the tiniest bed that any adult should ever sleep in. so sad for Captain Kingsley. Uh, I know, but I think there's kind of a reason for it. I'll get to it in just a minute. But Kate was up in this room cleaning up one day, and she said she felt something brush her neck and then lightly kind of brush her hair in this room. And then there's stories that Captain Kingsley doesn't like men but he's fond of the ladies, I guess. Right. So the ladies might get like soft touches, but the men get 
pushed or made to feel really uncomfortable in this room. He's territorial. I'm totally down with that. Visiting this area with our yes, <laughs> oh, see and seeing how the the different reactions. Yeah, I would totally love yeah. that, wouldn't you? Just to see if you got like that warm, fuzzy feeling. Well, I have been there with my mate, but I don't know that my mate spent any time, you know, because he thinks all this shit is bullshit. So <laughs> I'm not sure where he was while I was exploring. Probably wrestling children. Mm-hmm. Who knows? <laughs> but. uh Captain Kingsley suffered from a lung disease that forced him to sleep in an upright position, which might explain the tiny bed situation because he's more like in a recliner, you know, because he couldn't lay all the way down in order to allow his lungs to drain the fluid during the night. The captain attempted various treatments such as bleeding and taking mercury pills you know always a bad idea actually but they didn't know that bleeding out and taking mercury pills what year are we in again what i don't know what year we're in actually i don't have but that. this is like serious yeah this is definitely between the 1812 and 1814 period when the war All was right. going on but i'm not certain i mean he's a british officer so it's at some point in time when they were occupying the um fort there that he was there and this was his room and these were the things that he was doing there um or i guess afterwards as well but they didn't say that i don't really know that's crazy maybe this is a really bad history lesson that's okay we're not (laughs) this isn't a history podcast i'm sorry i i get super involved in the stories that i'm writing down the facts and i know with your notes and stuff (laughs) jesus christ can you be like more like me and bring ice and snacks instead of paper and pen. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got it. Okay, back to this mercury pill. These cures caused Kingsley to have terrible nightmares, fevers, and mood swings. The mercury slowly broke down in his body until he finally died in his oh, bed wow. in 1813. So I'm sorry. I did have a year for you. Yeah. <laughs> so obvious, obviously this happened sometime between uh, the time the, uh, the fort started being built in 1803 and then 1813 before the Americans took over the fort, I would assume. Uh, many believe that Kingsley has not left his bed due to his horrible death. And like Kate was saying, staff and visitors often report feeling the presence of someone or strange feelings when near the captain's bed, as well as hearing voices and footsteps near the bed. So basically, if you want a paranormal experience, get as close to the bed as possible (laughs) without touching it. Because actually there's barriers up. So you as a person just visiting the museum, you cannot get that close to the bed. However, when Ghost Adventures was there, Nick uh, sat in a chair right next to the bed. And then you hear Zach tell him, hey, get as close to the bed as possible without touching it. And I'm like, they were probably <laughs> told by the staff, you do not touch that motherfucking bed. <laughs> like, it's so old and it's so tiny and you can't break it. <laughs> oh, my God. And your the oils from your skin will just deteriorate this bed upon <laughs> touching it so yeah especially nick with all his hair gel and stuff so i mean keep keep a distance yeah right which by the way i think zach was rocking like a faux hawk (laughs) during the campaign it was pretty extreme spiked hair going on (laughs) okay so the last volunteer I'm going to talk about from the Ghost Adventures episode, his name is Daryl Learn. He's someone that I actually was fortunate enough to meet on our first visit to Fort Erie, which was like eight years ago. Um, and, and myself and my kids got a picture with him. He was super nice. And a really, it was really cool to meet him. And I felt so fucking nerdy being like, I'm sorry. Could we please take a picture with you? And because it just screams, I watched Ghost Adventures. I saw you on the TV. Like, can we please? <laughs> and but he was down for it. He was so super nice, and he would answer any question. He was so knowledgeable about the fort. And so, thank you, Daryl. You're a cool guy. I'm not sure that he volunteers there anymore since that was eight years ago. Oh, he might be doing something else with his life now. But because uh, in all the like pictures I've seen of the website 
for the fort these days and two years ago when we were there, I did not see him. So I think he must be doing something else now. But when Ghost Adventures was there, he was a big part of that whole thing. They interviewed him probably the most, and they also invited him back on the uh, investigation of the location. So during the day when they were interviewing him, he had stated that he had seen a man in a top hat with creepy white eyes. He said creepy white eyes? Just a white White eyes. Nothing Whoa. like some dude. He had come out from the kitchen. He was like in the yard. Daryl was. And then some guy comes out from the kitchen. And then the two of them lock eyes, except for this guy's got white eyes. And, and Daryl's just in a stare fest with him. And then all of a sudden the ghost just kind of turns and then heads towards the area where the big explosion happened in 1814 that like devastated so many British soldiers on the other side. So uh, Daryl mentioned that and he's kind of, you know, wary about that area. And then also the Sally Port, which is basically a tunnel that's between where the buildings are at and the yard in front of the buildings and then to the other side of the fort, which is now, I don't know what it might have been in the past, but right now it's just an open grassy area. Mm -hmm. So you go through this little tunnel, tunnel area and then you're just... It's more grassy area, and then it's the wall that's built up around the fort oh. where you would have had cannons or gunmen or whatever on that side. So there's not much on the other side except for open area. But this sally port, Daryl says, was constructed of human bone. Wow. They, what? They burned bodies and crushed oh. their bones down Man. and then put that in with whatever else you make walls with, I guess mud or whatever. <laughs> and so this Sally port is like a really creepy fucking area where they hear all these weird things or they just get weird feelings. And apparently 14 employees have quit just because they're so fucking scared of this Sally port. I'm sorry, but 14 isn't a good enough number for me. I'm so on board. <laughs> <laughs> um so during the ghost we need like 30 we need like one of those rounded hard numbers no i'm I'm just kidding yeah this could have just been 14 lazy people i'm not, <laughs> <laughs> not that hard to find them people with I mean, a bad work ethic yeah, right. Um, but uh, during the Ghost Adventures ep uh, investigation, like I said, Daryl was asked to come back in on the investigation. They left him mm. alone in the kitchen area because of what he had seen somewhat in that area before. And as he was standing there, um, I'm sorry, there was some weird noise in my room. Um, as he was mm. standing there alone and pretty much still as can be because you can watch him on camera he's just standing there and he's just kind of like hello is anybody here with me is anything going on and then all of a sudden in front of him there's this shadow figure of a fucking arm awesome hit the static cam is behind daryl so you see daryl's back and you see Daryl talking and then Daryl's like, then he reacts to this shadow figure as well. He goes, what the, what is that? You know, so like he was, saw some kind of movement and this shadow figure of a hand, you can, it's a, of the entire arm. You can see hand, you can see fingers, you see an elbow, then it like morphs. Like it lifts, it bends, and then it bends at the elbow. And then as the elbow kind of exits the view of the camera, it morphs into a misty-like thing instead of a solid figure. This is a not a full-spectrum nope. camera? This is this just is a, a regular night vision camera. One night vision camera, and it's over the um, the tour guide. Yes, it's on, it's on the tour guide in the kitchen. And you get to see this morphine from a solid shadow figure body, basically, to like a mist, and then it disappears. That's crazy. 
I do not remember this it's episode. It's pretty fucking extreme. And I saw a bunch of stuff out there on the internet where people were like, I call bullshit, I call bullshit, but not a single fucking person could explain how it could be bullshit. Right. They simply said their reactions were very mechanical afterwards. You know, they didn't freak out and go to the extreme, but it happened so <laughs> fast at the same time that I think, it's not something that you are like mind blown until you see kind of in slow or motion on replay. Right. You know, and so the, because they had a base camp set up, they had cameras on this Daryl guy and they're watching him and they saw something. They were kind of like, I think I saw a shadow, you know, it was just like, I think that was something right there. And they didn't just like forget, you know, freak out like, Oh my God. Whoa. What was that? But the dear, the Daryl guy was scared enough that he exited the kitchen and he did not want to go back in. He was done. I mean, well, he was done with that area. I think that as paranormal investigators, when something happens, your your immediate reaction, especially with light and shadows and things like that, your immediate reaction is not necessarily to freak out. It is a little like, well, what else could have caused that? Right. Let me think about that. And there's a long pause between you realizing Shit, there's no explanation for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also trying to reason it in your mind. So I feel like it's justified that they did not freak out immediately because totally. it probably happened so fast. They were just like, wait, what did we just see? Right. Um, Your brain is trying to reason it out. Yeah. And back then, and they definitely don't do it during the episode, they didn't play back things. They didn't have a J and a... Billy that is going to be like, watch this, watch what happened. So then they can all get scared afterwards. You know, they were just like, that's weird. I thought I saw something move. Right. All right, let's move on. Oh, now wow, this Daryl guy doesn't want to go back in the kitchen. Oh, well, we better be polite and not force him back into the kitchen. Okay, let's go investigate some other room then. You know, it was just people criticized them because they didn't go immediately to the kitchen and investigate. And then also, had uh, some shit talking to do about how they didn't freak out when they saw this arm because it's extreme, this arm, this vision of this arm. I'm going to have to find this shit on YouTube. I feel like if it was us, we wouldn't have even known it happened oh, right. until we went home. <laughs> we would have been at home two weeks later watching the video and been like, holy shit. And then I would have died in my room. Yeah. That hand was reaching out. And like I was in the room with the devil <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> Just an arm, really. But, you know. And, and that's not me and my love. For Ghost Adventures. Adventures defending them. I'm just saying I can I can sympathize with them in from a, a paranormal investigator standpoint. Wow. Especially and this is their fourth season yeah. before they had an old army of people and cameras on them. So it was this episode had come out like just shortly before we had gone to Canada for it would have been the second time for us but um so we went in 2010 to visit family in in Fort Erie and and it was after the Ghost Adventures episode had aired so of course I'm like you guys got to take me here and then these spots the kitchen and Captain Kingsley's room were like top of my list I will need to spend as much time in there as possible. Please take my children. I need to be alone. You know, so do do something with them, people. I have to be alone in this room for a while. So I lingered for a long time in captain in the captain's room and in the kitchen. And I remember getting an eerie feeling in the captain's room. Oh. And I even felt dizzy as I went down the stairs from, from the bedroom. But, you know, I was trying to be critical and thinking, well, you know, these, who knows, these steps might be uneven or something like that. Right. It's an old, old fort or whatever. The, but uh, I took tons of pictures when we were there. Where are these pictures? Well. Instagram needs them, Wendy. <laughs> I've got them, but I'm disappointed to say that uh, on our first visit and even our second, there is no photographic proof of anything paranormal. Still. There was a picture of this strange, like illuminated light mm. 
in the middle of this small little armory room that was uh, kind of below the captain's room that for years I thought, where would that have come from? That's some kind of light anomaly. It's paranormal. But like I said, two years ago, we revisited the fort and I immediately pretty much went to that spot, that little armory room and took a photo and got the exact same effect (laughs) on my camera. So it is most definitely some kind of reflection thing going on between the sunlight and my lens and the cracks that are on the back of the wall, I believe. Well, Wendy, that Uh, is what makes you an investigator right i mean had it been a full body apparition standing there like putting magazines away in the armory i would have been like yeah that's a motherfucking ghost and put it all (laughs) over everything but no it was like a little string of something you know and that falls into the category kind of of orbs and whatnot little it's a little light enough and i and it, the exact same thing happened the next time that I was there and taking pictures. And so I was like, yep, yeah, negative. That's Damn. that's just something on the wall. And we held on to that shit for almost seven years before yeah. we were ever back at Fort Erie. But on the our second trip, that was in 2017. This is when we went to visit people in Canada and then came to you and your area. And we went to Salem that year. So 2017. <laughs> 2017, it was our second trip back to the uh, Fort Erie area, and we went to the old Fort Erie, Um, and I got, this one was weird. So the first time I went there, Captain Kingsley room was a little odd to me, creepy, I was alone, then I went down the stairs, and I felt dizzy, but the second time we went back, I got an eerie feeling in the room below Captain Kingsley's room, which is set up as the soldier's ba- uh, bunk area. There's a bunch of bunk beds in there. And I remember we kind of drifted in as a guide was giving a tour to people. You know, I'm the type of person that won't like hang with the tour the whole time. But I drifted into this room just to see what he was saying, what he was talking about, listening to him. And uh, I, I wasn't in there very long. And all of a sudden I felt a I felt super lightheaded and I was really like drawn to like getting to the fucking window. The doors are open. If I wanted fresh air, I could have went to the doors. But for some reason, I was drawn to going to the window and to looking out. And it was like I needed air or I needed to just kind of look outside and see what was going on. But I remember feeling really sick all of a sudden and um, having it. And I went over to the window and that's how I started to feel better is I just kind of sit by the window. And then when the guy was done and moving on to another room with the group, I did not go with them anymore. But Mm. because I just felt kind of strange. Um, But that was the only time that I felt strange the second time around. We did spend more time on the other side of the Sally Port in the little grassy area. It was very peaceful and just kind of beautiful over there. And then we were in the kitchen area and <laughs> there it was a little eerie feeling, but I think it had something to do with the fact that as we were walking into the kitchen, we didn't expect that anybody would be in the room. We knew where the guide was with the whole tour and they were on the other side of the fort. And so we feel like we're alone and we're entering into the kitchen, right? Except for you had this feeling that there was something there. Like you kind of heard a little noises and things like that. And you're like, what is that? What is that? Well, there's a fucking lady in the kitchen, like a legit lady in the kitchen cooking cookies. <laughs> so she, they have the whole uh, like fire going and she's baking cookies in this fire and that's why we're feeling like heat and life and everything coming from this room because there's somebody in there so we did <laughs> we didn't we god damn it yeah fuck her and her cookies and those her. cookies those cookies were amazing by the way <laughs> i was gonna say it but they were amazing <laughs> no. <laughs> but I remember like myself and a, a couple of kids, maybe, I don't know how many kids I have, but um, we were <laughs> yeah, creeping around the corner because we were like, we ex- 
like I said, we were expecting to walk into an empty room and then you could just slowly, you're like, what is that? But, and then you walk in and there's this lady and we're like, oh, hi, you know, and she's like, oh, I have these cookies here for you or whatever. So we get our cookies from this woman and we're looking around the kitchen because of course I still want to hang out and take photos and whatnot. This is where that creepy arm was. I'm, I'm not giving up this spot that quickly just because she's in here baking cookies. Well, she eventually vamps out and I don't know where she goes, but she leaves. So I remember we were standing outside of the kitchen, but still lingering because, again, I want as many pictures as possible in the kitchen area. And the lady left. And then I was like, cool, I'm going to go in there and take more pictures and be alone now that she's gone. Well, my youngest is like, cool, I'm going to go in and steal some more cookies because they're out on the counter. So he goes in for cookies, gets his cookies, walks out. I go in to go take my pictures. The chandelier above where all of this table setting is and everything is shaking. No. And I was like, we are the only people in this area. We are the- like making noise shaking, like as no. if people are above you, stomping around on the floor. Like So yes and no. I heard nothing. We heard no stomping or anything like that. We were all obsessed with taking our pictures and eating cookies. That's what was going on. Is cookie brain and me taking pictures brain. And I, but I remember we were just in this room. Nobody else had been in there. We come out. We're lingering by the door, basically acting like, uh, what are you going bouncers by the, the kitchen door. And the chick has got to go take a break, go get more dough. I don't know. And then when I go back in, I'm like, Hey, uh, kid, was this, uh, chandelier shaking when you were in here a second ago? And he's like, what? No. And I was like, why is it shaking now? So that's wow. weird. But as we're like, that's strange. And then asking everyone else, when we first came in here and got cookies, do you remember the chandelier shaking or whatever? Or, or is, do you think that's too high, like for somebody to have hit it on the way out? We're all contemplating all the ways this thing could have been shaking. Then we get it in our heads. Okay, maybe somebody's walking upstairs and right. could have shook it that way. So we go upstairs, but it's been a while. It's been a few minutes as we thought about this. Nobody was upstairs. But like I just said, disclaimer, it's been a minute because we've been contemplating this. Could somebody have been upstairs and then have left upstairs? Yes. So I'm not going to tell you, oh, my God, the chandelier is haunted in the kitchen or anything. But I am pointing it out. It was enough for us to be like, that's odd. And then something was happening. Yes. So as we're like, what do we think? What could cause this? Do you think these floors are weak enough that? And so I send motherfuckers up the stairs to go see. Go see if there's somebody's upstairs and yell out the windows and let me know. And so we did this whole thing. I appreciate my family supporting my weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> and exploring these options with me, but like they don't care. They're just like, okay, mom, sending me upstairs to see if there's people here or a ghost, whichever. Uh, I mean, so Old Fort Erie is personally, it personally has not been this extreme paranormal location for me. I've only ever visited it during the day. But I know something is there from the ex the tiny experiences that I've had and listening to this history and the encounters that other people have had and shared throughout the years. This has been going on for a long time. I know this location is full of energy from the past and it will forever be on my list of when I'm up in that area visiting family and it's not negative 100 degrees outside because that's what it felt like. That's <laughs> what it's felt like when we were there. But uh when it's good weather and we can visit, I will always hope to take a drive by and visit Fort Erie, old Fort Erie, uh, just for that chance at a glimpse of looking into the past and experiencing what used to be with the spirits that still reside there. So, but I will tell you in uh, Niagara on the Lake, which isn't too far from Fort Erie, 
there were some places that I definitely wanted to like drive by and eat at or whatever because they were said to be haunted. And uh, one of them is this house that's abandoned. So it's like, it's this old house. Shit. I meant to look up the address. Now I don't remember it. Um, and I didn't look it up. But there's a house in that area, a Niagara on the Lake. And they're restoring all these houses. And this is like expensive property. And somebody owns this house and will not fix it up for some reason. And it's been like that for fucking years. Like 50 plus years. Somebody bought it and then they're just like, nope, negative. So there's all these stories about how a family had bought it and stayed like a couple of weeks in the house or something. And then we're like, negative. We can never be there. Hmm. But there's also stories that that family bought a bunch of houses and used this house as like a storage unit, basically, <laughs> which can you imagine being so rich? Uh, they just apparently shopped all the time for old furniture and whatnot. And they stored it in this place and this place kept getting broken into that. They eventually like boarded it up to keep people out. But wow. of, now everybody thinks it must be so evil if you're not going to live in it and you just board it up like that. The people that did that and owned it passed away. It eventually did resell to someone They've yet to remodel it or anything, though, as well. And it just sits mm. empty. The last Demons. that I knew of. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I wanted to drive by, and there's plenty of people that have gotten close enough to the property, even though there's a bunch of no trespassing signs on it. They've gotten close enough to the property to take pictures kind of through cracks and whatnot. But because of the snow and the bad weather and stuff like that, we never got to do that. But I was like, Ooh, I want to see this house that nobody wants to live in, oh <laughs> in a gorgeous area. I mean, Niagara on the Lake is like fucking million dollar homes and stuff. There's B&Bs and, right. and restaurants that are all old and haunted and gorgeous. And, and then there's just this house boarded up. Wow. So there's got to be a story to it. But if you have a passport or a passport card and you can drive to Canada, by all means, please do. I love Canada because, Wendy, you go there often enough and you have amazing stories. So I wrote down a thousand notes tonight. My hand is like crippled from all of the <laughs> writing that I've been doing. I am very appreciative of my Canadian married into heritage <laughs> I uh, love them very much. We have such a great time when we're there. And um, the Southern Canadian into New York area, I mean, yeah. that's a road trip waiting to happen. There's so much stuff going on there. You know, I said, but not just on the Canadian side, too, on the on the Buffalo and, and Niagara Falls, American side and stuff. There's I mean, we've got to visit that shit for Hell sure yeah. someday. But anyways, that's cool because we're peacing out, right? Yeah. I love Canada. Rick, you're awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for being a fan of our show and to all of our other listeners. We appreciate you guys. You know, subscribe, C-O-T-N underscore paranormal. Yeah. Please, please, please give us your comments. Let us know what you think. Uh, share with your friends to spread the word about this awesome podcast talking about haunted places all over the world, uh, Canada included there. And you can message us on any of those forms of social media that Chris just mentioned, along with our Gmail account, which is creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com. So send us your stories. If you're in Southern Canada, I visit there often. Please share your stories with me. Give me some more locations to visit. If you know anything about that boarded up house on, in the Niagara on the Lake area, please tell me some stuff. I know some other people have snooped around there. So I'd love to hear some more stuff about that. And yeah, you guys are awesome. Thanks so much for listening. And we are out. Bye. Goodbye. I definitely saw something there. It's a pretty freaky thing, I guess you could say. It was just a shadow.